Welcome to the DevRelX podcast, the podcast brought to you from the DevRelX community and slash data. This podcast is devoted to developer marketing, relations, and advocacy. I'm Stathis Yorgakopoulos, and I'm your host. In each episode, we welcome a guest from the developer marketing world to talk about best practices, lessons learned, how-tos, data, and share insights and experiences to help you boost your DevRel game and win developers' hearts. You can find more people like you and resources, developer ecosystem data, news, jobs, and a bi-weekly digest at devrelx.com. Hello and welcome to the DevRelX podcast. Today we have a special episode for you, part of our Master Tip series. In our Master Tip series, you listen to tips and best practices from the panel discussions we put together for the DevRelX Summit, which took place on October 12 and 13. Impact via influence, keys to DevRel success within the organization. This is the theme of today's episode and panel discussion with Mary Thankval, Director of Developer Relations at Camunda, Wakas Makdum, Head of DevRel and Community at Slowflake, Katie Miller, Director of Developer Marketing at Slack, and hosted by Sean Falconer, Head of Developer Relations at Skyflow. Before I leave you to enjoy the discussion, I want to tell you that the State of the Developer Nation report is now available for you to download for free. In this latest edition, we we'll look at the latest trends in software development by analyzing the responses of more than 20,000 developers. You can download the report at the link in the description or at slashdata.co. Now, let's get to our first session of the day. This panel is definitely something many of you have been looking forward to. Let's welcome the panel's host, Sean Falconer, Head of Developer Relations at Skyflow, and our panelists, Mary, Wakas, and Katie. Sean, over to you. Thanks. It's great to be here. Hi, everyone. We're live. My, as I was nicely introduced, my name is Sean Falconer, and I lead developer relations and product marketing at Skyflow. I'm super excited to be here. If you can't tell from my tone, I've been really looking forward to this. I've had a significant amount of coffee <laughs> this morning. So, and you know, as they say, there ain't no party like a DevRel party because the DevRel party don't stop. So we have an amazing group of panelists. I think we're still waiting on a few people to join, but uh, we will still soldier on regardless. But we're going to be talking about the keys to DevRel success within an organization. And why don't we, as we hopefully wait for some other people to join, I see Mary is, is joining soon. Why don't we start off with Katie, you introducing yourself. Sure, great. It is so exciting to be here, and I am pleased to be joining you on the coffee train this morning. I'm Katie Miller. I'm Director of Developer Marketing at Slack. I looked at my calendar and realized that this is officially 10 years of being full-time working in the developer relations and developer marketing space. Took what was part of my role within ads product marketing, working on API growth, And that was the fun part and have never looked back. So really excited to be here talking about my perspective and experiences on the relationship of DevRel and Dev Marketing. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Mary, do you want to go next? Sure. My name is Mary Thingval. I am the Director of Developer Relations at a company called Kamunda. We are a source available process orchestration software, and I lead three different functions within that developer experience, which focuses on making sure that our product is easy to use and that people have a a good experience with it. Developer advocacy, which focuses more on that relationship between the people using our product and the people creating and marketing and selling our product. And then community management, which is focused heavily on our community platforms, the experience that people have with those platforms, as well as amplifying the voices of people who are really engaged. I've been doing this for, I think, officially 10 years. More like 15 if you pull in kind of the like, oh, I was doing community and all these other ways before as well. And I just, I love the storytelling aspect. I love the problem solving aspect. I love being able to help people and enable people to use our software better and really connect with each other as well as some of my coworkers along the way. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think many people who before, long before they ever have an official developer relations title, have actually been developed doing developer relations in some capacity. So, uh, Wakas, would you mind uh, introducing yourself as well? Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Wakas Maktoum, and I lead the developer relations and community at Snowflake. We are the data platform for a variety of uh, workloads with thousands of customers. And uh, yeah, my focus is on developer advocacy, open source, as well as the general community management and development. 
Awesome. All right. So we have a lot to cover. So we're going to just start to kind of jump in here. So I, I originally came up with this idea for the panel because, you know, I often see people in developer relations struggle to work with different functional areas within a business and also different functional areas sometimes struggle to actually understand what developer relations is and how to best work with them as well. And we often are placed in a position where we need to impact an organization without you know, having direct authority. We aren't necessarily the boss of these you know, different parts of, of the organization. We have to influence you know, maybe the product roadmap, sales motions, marketing language, even engineering decisions. So as the you know, kickoff question here, why do you th- is there sometimes tension between developer relations and other functional areas like sales, marketing, engineering within the organization? And what can developer relations leaders do to reduce that tension? I'm yeah, happy to kick things off yeah, here. I think sometimes that tension exists because people don't really understand where DevRel fits in, right? And I think because there are elements of product management, right? We speak to customers, we speak to users, we try to make that experience better, we collect feedback. There's also overlap with marketing as far as content production and speaking at conferences and awareness of the product and who we are and what we do. There's some overlap with, you know, customer success, right? There's so many different overlaps with different teams that we have, engineering, everything else, that I think that tension sometimes get amplified because people either go, hey, hang on, you're doing things that I do and maybe I should be doing that instead of your team doing that. Or they're just confused about what your primary goal is. And so from my perspective, one of my biggest roles as a leader in the company is making sure that other teams understand, A, I'm, I'm not trying to take this thing away from you. I want to collaborate, right? It's, it's not, hey, I'm taking the last slice of pie, but let's, let's create a bigger, a bigger circle. Let's collaborate and, and try to help people more generally. So I think that's the first part is helping other people understand that you're not in there to take things, but to rather amplify what they're already doing. And then the second thing is making sure that your team has a very specific goal and you could impact other things across the company as well. But what's the main focus for your team? What impact do you specifically have that can be attributed back to your team and your team alone? Mm -hmm. Excellent. And Katie, across anything to add to that? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to add to that. I think The experience that I've had is developer relations sits in this incredibly critical, I don't want to say neutral spot, but it isn't necessarily explicitly tied to revenue. It isn't explicitly tied to just growth numbers, this, that, or the other thing, and yet has influence. And so in organizations that are very binary or very causal where it's looking for this happens and then this happens and there's a number behind it and a very concrete critical number to there needs to be a trust in something that is more corollary that there is going to be influence and there's going to be influence in a number of different ways and it may be a little bit more complex to see where those levers are and yet at the same time if you remove all of those things, all of a sudden you see the impact the organization has. And so I would very much plus one to the importance of making sure that there's awareness and understanding of the value add. And yet it it is when looking at brass tacks and saying, I need folks who are tied to this, I need folks who are tied to that, to make the case for the value and impact of an organization that is going to be Moving gentle levers in a lot of different places. Yeah. Yeah. Plus one to what Mary and Katie have said. I, I think in general, being intentional about these points of intersection that we have from different functions in the organization and sort of like based off of that, really sort of like identifying the key programs that fit in. So one of the things that we've done is that uh, I'll talk about it later, but basically we have a few programs where they would fit into, for example, marketing or, or with sales. And, but there is a key developer component to it. And then sort of like, you know, connecting and 
and having these sort of like, you know, hand on with those programs and doubling down those programs program in, some, in many cases. And then being intentional about the the segments and the charter and the use cases that went after is, is another uh, key sort of like strategy that you've identified as as being needle moving in terms of like getting that cross-functional counting effect, which is critical, right? So like DevRel function and for many of in isolation isn't really the, uh, you know, on its own is, is uh, relatively smaller. So how do you get that compounding effect? Yeah, excellent. And I think, you know, I think there's a number of points that each of you made that I'd like to kind of dig into. You know, one of the things, Mary, that you started off talking about was the fact that, you know, a lot of times people don't know where DevRel fits in. And even in my current organization, I think for a long time, no one knew where, who I reported to. And in some ways, I, I, I kind of like that because it shows that by, you know, spreading myself across different functional areas, and which is something I think that develop, you know, is key to developer relations because it is this umbrella that touches a lot of areas. But given how cross-functional DevRel is, it's also hard for any one person in an organization, I think, to fully grasp everything the developer relations function is doing. You know, marketing is going to see developer relations through the contributions that developer relations is directly making to marketing. And product sees it through sort of the product lens, engineering through the engineering lens, and so on. So what are some of the problems that this potentially causes? And how should someone navigate this or break down the the problem of silos while still sort of balancing the like potential problems with like people feeling that they are developer relations is maybe stealing their thunder or stepping on their their toes. I'm I'm happy to take this one first. Um, yeah, go ahead, and 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 I think that this is a message that I've heard in a number of different articles and developer programs events is the importance of developer centricity, which is really putting the user or the developer first and understanding what is the problem we're solving and what is the opportunity we're creating. Because that, to me, is what breaks down those silos. And instead of saying, I'm seeing it this way, you're seeing it that way, it's saying, this is, this is what we want to create together, aspirationally. And here are the different skills we each bring to the table that will, in an additive way, allow us to create that together. That that's really how I think about it. I I I realize in practice based on how companies are in fact organized, how different departments are incentivized and so forth, in practice that can be trickier. But the places that I found it most successful is when we can all come to this table and say we're we're in this together and we each have our special sauce that we're adding to this to this recipe. And really value and trust what each of us brings to the table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the same work makes the dream work, as they say. Yeah, yeah. I think that, like, just to kind of like further expand expand on this, we're basically like what we intend to do is 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 have DevRel as more of like the orchestrator for many of the programs. And then also identify if there are any unifying set of metrics that we basically, that we can kind of like identify and work towards. So like having that unifi- unifying metric really helps in, in bringing in different teams together. And it could be a set of metrics. And then secondly, I think like the key, key I would say, skill set for a successful dev- developer advocate, developer relations lead manager, even individual contributor is they are able to orchestrate different functions and different cross-functional players together versus just, you know, doing their own thing. Right. Yeah. The idea of essentially scaling beyond oneself. Yes. A Mary and I, Yeah. I think from my side that cross, cross-functional communication, cross-functional teams is really what it comes down to. Because you mentioned this a little bit as well, but that idea of, you know, we can't be siloed and working in our own team when we really do collaborate with other teams. And so I think to a certain extent that that breaking down of silos is part of the role that DevRel plays within the company where we are the people that are, you know, the hub of the wheel, right? That are kind of going out to all of the other teams and going, oh, hang on, marketing's working on this, but I'm hearing this from our pre-sales engineering team as well. And hey, product management is working on this, but I'm hearing for this from product marketing as well. And so for us to be that bridge and really be able to break down those silos is huge. And it's 
interesting because if you do kind of a pros and cons list of, well, if Devra lives in marketing, then, you know, here's the pros and cons. And if Devra lives in product, here's the pros and cons. You find they're basically just flip flopped, <laughs> right? In marketing, you have the advantage of all of the company messaging, all of the outward facing, outbound messaging for whatever your audience is lived under the same division. But then you've got, you know, the removal from the conversations with product because you're not in those product leadership team meetings and vice versa. You know, if you're not in marketing, but you're in product, then you're removed from those brand and messaging conversations. And where does that leave the community, right? Is that included then in those conversations? Are you left out, but you're closer to product, which is great because you're now involved in those conversations. And so I think the the key for me is never which department should we technically live in, but how do we keep those conversations open? How do we make sure that we've got those connections in the different departments and that we're constantly aware of what else is going on and making sure that people people know what they need to know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a sort of excellent lead into, I think, a question that comes up all the time in developer relations is, around reporting structure and, you know, where should it live? There's probably, you know, maybe not one answer to that question. And then there's also, I think, this challenge where, you know, for example, in the 2022 Developer Relations Compensation Report, at least, you know, 33% of the teams that responded in that report reported into marketing. So, however, there's also, I think, sometimes this like guttural negative reaction within some parts of the DevRel community that when it comes to the reporting structure, the idea of developer relations be, having any link to marketing is somehow seen offensive. And you know, I guess, first off, any additional comments around reporting structure for developer relations and sort of how that maybe impacts how you actually do your job and sort of run your team? And then the set follow-up to that is, why do you think, even given that one third of at least the people reported responded to that survey reported to marketing, there's this sort of this like tension that's happens between being associated with too much with marketing? Yeah, so we're we're in marketing, and I think it's kind of it basically helps us a lot because you know the 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 way we're able to execute on a series of events like we have a conference, big conference coming up build. We have a series of build locals and a lot of like, you know, the swag and other things we can do, we we'll would be able to do through any other function. At the same time, I think regardless of the function you're in, you basically have to come up with your own metrics. So we don't really operate by the traditional or classic marketing metrics. We have our own like developer success and developer adoption and developer engagement metrics. So that kind of sort of like changes the the sort of like the overall dynamics and you're not like basically restricted to that to that one template. So I'm biased definitely with the, by being in marketing. So I think has significant advantages, but uh, uh, but I've seen DevRels in other teams kind of bouncing between different functions over like every every single year. I think what you said there, Aka, about you know the goals that you have aren't associated with the traditional marketing goals, right? That's the key. And I think for a lot of teams who are switched to marketing, the fear is okay. Our goals are now acquisition and retention and awareness solely from a sales standpoint. And so if that's the only thing that the team is being, you know, the success is being engaged on, back to our initial comment about, you know, there's so many things we have an impact on. Sure, the content that we create helps people be more aware of our products. The easier the product is to use, the more likely it is that someone's going to stick around after they've signed up, right? All of those things have an impact, but if the metrics that are assigned to our team are number of signups or number of people who stick around or number of people using the product on a regular basis, it's difficult to be mindful of the advocacy side of things because we're only geared toward how do we get more people to sign up. And so I think from my perspective, no matter what team you report into, you have to have those separate goals that are specifically focused on developer relations strengths, whether that's community growth, whether that's double qualified leads and you're you know making those introductions across the company, whatever that happens to be. But as long as whoever your C-suite reporting structure is, as long as they agree, hey, we, we don't fall into traditional 
marketing metrics. We don't fall into traditional product management metrics. We don't fall into traditional engineering metrics, right? Which is why I tend to say, make us our own department. (laughs) Because I don't want to be under that umbrella of, well, this is what our team as a whole does. And by the way, DevRel kind of does their own thing, but no one really understands what the reporting structure is. And I fully agree. And I've, I've had the opportunity to sit both in developer relations and in marketing organizations. And I, I've seen the pros and cons and where it's felt most successful hasn't had to do with being in one organization or the other. It's really had to do with the culture around it and going back to the importance of those cross-functional teams and that spirit of breaking down silos, breaking down roles and coming together and putting the developer at the center of that. And a lot of it does come from the top-down culture and leadership. And it also comes from kind of the groundswell in the individuals who can do that advocating from their own experience from the ground up of showing that benefit and opportunity. In terms of that question, that visceral reaction to marketing, particularly, I think I might be the one true developer marketer title on the call at the moment. Obviously, I think about this a lot. I think back to that moment 10 years ago, probably this week, where I made the switch from being in our core ads business into developer marketing. And they said, welcome to developer marketing. You cannot market to developers. And I had a like hot minute of head scratching and pausing, being like, do I, do I have a job? Like, mm-hmm. what am I doing here? And And it took some time and it definitely took some humility. And I think it's because, especially in larger organizations that are not necessarily developer-first or developer-centric organizations with really strong consumer brands, which is where I was at the time, it's very easy to see that type of corporate consumer marketing and think it's then going to be parlayed over into developers. And, And then the word marketing gets stuck on it. And what I've realized is when you break down marketing 101 to the core, and again, this is very common phrase, know your audience, know the magic and connect the two. If we're truly understanding that audience and building products and programs and experiences that meet their needs, that solve their problems, create their opportunities, and are communicating with them in the ways that they've shared, they'll respond and resonate to, and it resonates with them, then then that is that is marketing. But I think it's not seeing marketing as this, you know, the Times Square billboard, the viral TikTok ads and so forth. But what are those? I always say, what's the pixie dust? What's the magic for developers? And you really can blow their minds and inspire them, but there just needs to be that transparency, that authenticity, that humility, that we're building something that is going to create opportunities and solve your problems and be relatively easy and be sticky and so forth. So I think it's, it's that, that to me is, is the, what removes that friction is making sure that it's clear that the marketing is done in that authentic audience centric way. Right. Yeah. I think that's an excellent point. Like I always say you hear this reaction or you hear this sentiment that you can't market to developers. And I think the, the reality is like, you can't do bad marketing to developers, but no, no one likes bad marketing to start, I mean, you know, whether you're a developer or not. So it's just, you need to kind of do, maybe you need to do a little bit more work to market to developers in a way that's going to resonate with them in, in an authentic way. And I think that really comes down to sort of value add. But there was a couple, you know, things that, just to kind of summarize some of the things that were said, you know, it sounds like one of the big keys to having impact in an organization is, not just focus on sort of external relationship building, but also focus on inter- internal relationship building. So building those relationships, champions within the organization, making sure that they kind of understand what you do and the value that you bring. And then also that's important because depending on your reporting structure, if you're in marketing, like Wakas said, certain things are easier. You know, you might be able to, you have sort of more control over running events or you know, the branding messaging and stuff like that. And you might have to work a little bit harder on the product side. But if you're a product, then you're in those meetings, you're part of the ideation product side on the product, but you have to work a little bit harder to get marketing to believe in the things that you want to believe in. So there's kind of this like push and pull. And then also the last thing is around 
regardless of your reporting structure, it really comes down to defining metrics that are important to develop relations and that you actually have control over and using those as the, the, the way that essentially you're showing value to the organization, explaining your value rather than getting locked into, okay, well, I'm going to do MQL generation because I'm in marketing or I'm going to do something specific to product or engineering because I'm in those organizations. Sure. And I, I just want to reiterate something that Katie said that it, at the end of the day, it really is determined by your culture at your company and the priorities of the, the senior leadership at your company, right? At Kamunda, I sit under the CTL directly in the products division. I work heavily with marketing because our events budget comes from marketing, but they aren't deciding what events we're going to, right? They're looking to me and my team to say, hey, here's the developer events that are relevant, that we should be present at, that we should be sponsoring. And so there's a partnership there that's very well understood because they're leaning on subject matter experts throughout the company to say, yes, these are the places that we need to be. Same with our content team, right? The blog is owned by product marketing. They lean heavily on my team for not only what content should we be publishing, but then also the creation of that content. So regardless of what team you sit in, if that understanding of community is a pillar of what we do, it's a pillar of our success. It's a foundational part of what we do as a company. It doesn't really matter what team you're on as long as you're still facilitating those relationships and making sure that those communication structures are strong. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So one of the other things that Katie, you had mentioned earlier, I believe, was the idea that there's sort of no like mathematical formula or easy mathematical formula for developer relations. Like, you know, sales, you can kind of, you, know, you can do a formula and for SDRs or inside sales or AEs in, in a spreadsheet. And, you know, you, you plug in the numbers of salesperson, revenue comes out the other end. It's very easy to kind of have a mathematical formula that explains and justifies resource allocation. It's, I think, a harder story to tell in developer relations. And I think, you know, there, it's very common for developer relations teams to struggle to show their value to the organization. I think given the current sort of macroeconomics in the world right now where companies are actively reducing headcount, which has impacted a number of developer relations teams, at least from a sort of outsider's perspective from what I see on the internet, this is probably more relevant than ever, ever, but how do you go about sort of proving your value to an organization? I, it's, it's such an important question. And I, I, I'll need to go back and find the link. There was a really good article written by, I think it was the former head of marketing at Twilio. And it really talked about not having a single North Star metric but really looking at a constellation of metrics. It might not have been the word constellation, but it was really looking at the relationship of a series of metrics together. And there needs to be that culture in the company that allows the space for that. But it really is the relationship around some of those reach and engagement metrics, which may be a little bit more anonymous and yet at the same time show the breadth and depth of the curiosity and affinity for something. And then starting to connect it as much as possible to apps published, you know, the stickiness of the platform and things like that. And even if developer relations isn't necessarily accountable to any one given thing, is trying to connect in as much as possible the specific things there. One thing that that was brought up actually was MQLs, which I thought was an interesting one. And this is where... I like to say it's okay to be opportunistic with metrics as well, even if it isn't direct. So one thing, for example, in previous work in events, we would collect leads at events and it was an opportunity to do follow-up and so forth. But we would then submit them into our instance of SFDC for processing. And even though we weren't primarily driven by follow-up, we weren't primarily driven by revenue. It was an opportunity to be able to speak the language of other organizations to not only say, this is the aggregate reach that we've had through the dollars that we've invested and the added value we've had in the way that we've been able to influence these communities. We also were able to successfully influence revenue in these ways as well. So it wasn't a primary driver, but 
there were systems in place that it was relatively easy for us to plug into and then show value, additional value and impact. So I think it's looking for those opportunities to not have to invent a new wheel, but to plug into existing metric systems in a in a way of minimal minimal friction that I think has has really made a difference. I was going to agree agree with everything that uh, Katie has said. The only thing that I would add on in addition to metrics, you also need to have like a little bit of that sort of like the the story or the vision of why DevRel and what what is the sort of like the role of DevRel in long term. And that's kind of like a combination of I think both art and science. So like showing that like you know in long term there's a bunch of these this this sort of like you know for example in our case it's like you know how do you create this 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 group of influencers or creating a sort of like the bottoms up motion that by winning the hearts and minds that would complement a top down selling motion that is already in a machine that is already in place. So having that buy in and having that conviction also from the senior leadership is key because then you have like this sort of like this open canvas and you can pick up the key program to run with. So it's like once you have that, so then I think like, yes, you gotta be, you have to be more intentional about how how does DevRel fit into impacting the existing program. So one one of the, the one example is that one of our programs called Powered by Snowflake, which goes like basically a lot of software companies that use Snowflake as the backend use. And it has a sort of like a sales sort of component to it because like a go-to-market piece and the account managers get involved. But at the same time, there's a design filler of the program, which basically helps the developers and architects and engineers to get started with Snowflake and figure out like what are some of the best practices, et cetera. And that's where DevRel fits. And so that's how it sort of like, you know, fits into the overall, also overall company metrics and and really is needle moving there. So, yeah. Great. So... I think there's a couple of things there that's worth sort of, you know, touching on or, or, you know, I don't know, double clicking on. I hate that phrase, but <laughs> I'll use it anyway. You know, you need sort of that core belief alignment from as a business about believing in what developer relations can kind of bring to the organization. At the same time, I really liked that point, Katie, that you made about, uh, I think, I forget where the person was, maybe it was Microsoft or something, but this idea of not having like a single North Star, but a constellation of metrics. And I think that's really key because there is so much that DevRel can sort of impact and, and, and influence that is really hard to sum that up in a single or metric. And then at the same time, looking for these opportunities where you can also tell a story about how maybe you're impacting revenue because that is something that, of course, all businesses need to do. They want to grow revenue. And if you can show some directional impact to revenue, that's a good thing in the overall. So we have a bunch of audience questions, but before we get there, I just want to ask one more question to the panel, which is that, in, uh, Mary, you talked a little bit about this idea earlier of DevRel potentially sitting within its own sort of reporting structure. There's been a lot of growth in developer-first companies, really probably since 2013 and on, and more and more companies are starting developer relations functions earlier in their life cycle. However, there's still not a lot of DevRel folks in the C-suite of an organization. So why do you think this is, and sh- should it change? And if it should, how does one start to affect that change? I love this question. I think the eventual goal is definitely someone who's in the C-suite directly related to developer relations, community relations, audience, all of that. I've seen a couple companies, mostly larger companies, who have adopted that, you know, chief community officer kind of title over the last couple of years. But honestly, I think the main reason why we're not seeing it more right now is because we're still in that phase where we're struggling to say, this is the metric that we own. This is, you know, the definitions for these titles and these roles. And so if you look across companies, developer advocate at one place has different requirements, different expectations, different responsibilities than a developer advocate at another place. Whereas if you look at, you know, demand gen within marketing, there's a general expectation and knowledge of this is what the demand gen department does. This is what product management does, right? And so I think the more that we can move toward those standard definitions of what is a developer advocate, what is a community manager, what is technical community builder, what are all of these different titles that we have, the easier it'll be for us to not only get ourselves to a place where more senior leaders within companies are listening and understanding the value that we bring to the table, but also 
entering into that phase where we can say, look, we need someone at the C-suite to sit at the table to make these decisions alongside the rest of our senior leaders. Mm, Yeah. Anything to add to that before we jump into audience questions? Okay, great. I think that's a good place to to leave the the main panel questions, the future vision of, you know, all of us sitting in the C-suite. So so the first question we have is, what do you all suggest startups with a solo developer relation, DevRel, should focus on most for a DevRel person to succeed and showcase their value? I can start here. One is not just what the company goals are, but what the stage is in the product or platform development. And what's really needed in that moment? Is it at a place where it's early stage? And so it really is about that listening and learning and user experience side. Is it at a stage where you need to get someone's hands on it? And so someone really needs to be focusing on more of that support and scaffolding and onboarding. So I think that that's the first way to really think about that first hire. The other way that I would think about it is really being someone who has enough, not just depth and breadth of experience, but also openness and curiosity and flexibility within the role. Because what I just described could describe a year of somebody's role, depending on how quickly a company matures. And so someone who is adept and set up to jump in and be customer facing who's adept and can jump in and work on documentation, especially if there's that proof of concept that needs to come to life before an organization can grow. And the the final thing, and this is a pitch to DevRelX and slash data, is there is a lot of longitudinal data that really shows what those core programs are that help make something sticky for developers. And I, I don't love the phrase more wood behind fewer arrows. I think we're all bristling at those corporate phases, phrases that we're using. And yet at the same time, it's if you're one human, there's only so much one human can do. And so how to think about listening to the developers and hearing what they need at its core to make something sticky and doing a couple things really, really well. Yeah, I think another key as well as somebody who's stepping into an organization as the sole person that's like establishing the functions. They, you should know what the expectations are going in. You know, you need to kind of explore what does whoever's hiring you, you know, what, what do they think developer relations does? What are, why are they starting to hire that person? And make sure that that aligns with your own abilities and understanding of what you can bring to the organization as well. So I think we have time for this one last question. Which is, oh, I uh, see, what is the right, I, I get this question all the time. <laughs> it's the hard one to answer. What is the right size of a DevRel organization for a company? Number of developer advocates is the question. Well, Kosh, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I mean, I hate to say, but it depends, right? So it kind of depends a lot on things that Katie just touched on and Mary touched on right, in terms of like, you know, the, the phase you're in, in terms of the, the company's adoption, whether you are a developer first or a developer first a plus kind of a company what are you trying to get out of the devrel group function right so yeah i mean I, I, there's no one answer i think it like for example like i would look at i would basically step back and look at what the goals are from dev from devrel in terms of like whether it's developer education is the focus and then finding that right skill set there or it is around developer experience and, you know, how much of the work is needed in terms of like building up the tooling, which tends to get really, you know, require a lot more headcount and a lot more resources to whether it's about just like developer awareness. And that would be as much smaller or, or organization with more program managers and event managers who run a bunch of events and hackathons, et cetera. So it really depends on like, you know, the, the, the sort of like the phase of the DevRel maturity journey you're in, as well as what is the company do with how how they think about developers and audience. And super quick plug in, I'm going to toot Mary's horn on this one for the extraordinary work that you do around building community is if headcount isn't going to be flush, is really thinking about that second or third hire being really deeply focused on community space and how to build a community of internal advocates and external advocates who aren't necessarily on your team to give you that list in that, in that reach. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Mary, do you have anything quickly to add to that? I would say the only additional thing is if you're trying to advocate for headcount, building out a, this is who, what we're able to accomplish with the current team. Here's what we could accomplish with one or two additional people. Here's what we could accomplish with my unicorn ideal, however many people you absolutely want on the team, right? But laying it out in those types of terms so that your management can see what's the, the potential if we add more people is always a great way to go about it. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that kind of modeling is is critical, especially in large organizations where it really comes down to they, they might not, the people making those decisions might not 100% understand what you do. So they need, you need to paint a vision for where we are today, where we can be if we add, you know, X number of people and so on. And it's a bit of a sales job. You know, you got to kind of come in maybe shooting a little higher than what you really want. So, you know, we're, as we wrap, I, I just first want to thank our panelists so much for being here. When I first sort of conceived of this idea, I was thinking about, you know, who's my dream panelist? And each of you were the first three names that came to mind. So I was very happy when you positively responded to my request about doing this. I'm also excited that we're actually going to be all meeting in person later today. So it's such a rare treat in the last few years. And I also want to thank everyone that was out there listening and those that sending questions. I know we didn't get to all the questions. Maybe we can answer those questions sort of asynchronously in the uh, DevRLX Slack channel. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. And also from our side, thank you to our panelists for such a great kickoff. As Sean mentioned, you can connect with them on our DevRLX Slack and continue the conversation there and ask any questions that we weren't able to address in the discussion. Thank you for listening to the DevRLX podcast, the podcast devoted to developer marketing and relations. You can listen to all episodes, find free resources, the latest news, and join our community at DevRLX.com. And you can always subscribe to our bite-sized bi-weekly digest or follow us on Twitter at slash data HQ.